October 24th, 2020. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us another day of rest. Thank you for taking all of our problems, all of our stresses, and all of the things which overwhelm us away. We know that if we turn to you in honesty, you will relieve us and cure us. And so, Father, when we go to you, when we enter into your throne through prayer, please bless us. Help us, Father. Please help us. Because as you've, as you've shown us so clearly and so concisely, trying to live these lives according to how we think and how we feel just ends in catastrophe. So please, Father, give us hearts that are willing and able to submit. We pray, Father, that our faith would grow each and every second of each and every day, and that you would have us to just rely completely in you. And as we explore your word today, please open our minds and our hearts so that we could understand and believe the truths that you give. And Father, let us never try to twist your word into meaning something that it doesn't because you define your word perfectly. And if we find in ourselves a belief or a thought which contradicts your word, then please give us the faith to reject it so that we could fully embrace what you say. Please, Father, let only your truth be spoken or heard. And Father, please, be with us as we know you surely are, because as you've told us, that where two or more are gathered, you are here with us. As best we can, we make these prayers to you, Father, in the name of your only begotten Son, our returning Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Alrighty, so today we are going through commandment number nine, and as I said earlier, I'll try to keep the I'll try to keep the commentary to a minimum, simply because there is a lot of scripture to go through. This happens to be uh, just my personal opinion. This is next to commandment number four. Commandment number nine is insanely important because it, it's very difficult to tell the difference between truth and lies nowadays. And uh, as with any of the commandments, keeping the commandments doesn't even necessarily mean that we are living in a state of righteousness because without full submission to Christ, we can't keep the, comm the commandments anyway. So, in case there has ever been any confusion from here, no, it's never, it's never been stated here, nor will it ever be stated, that we are saved by keeping the commandments, because that's simply impossible. No, we keep the commandments because we are saved, because it's only through being saved that we have the capability of keeping the commandments at all. It's only through full submission and repentance that the law is finally written on our hearts. And it's written on our minds. It becomes the thing that we study. It becomes the thing that um, that reveals where our sins are. Because that's, I mean, the Ten Commandments reflects where we are filthy, where we are sinful, so that we could go, so that we could go to God, confess, repent, and be cleansed of all those sins. And commandment number nine that we're doing next is, uh, it's very important because it, I mean, like I said, it's all about lies. And as we well know, lies run totally contrary to the character of God. But you'll see that as we go on. Is there any way you could him or something? So, just a moment. Animal problems. Thank you, Lily. So we find the ninth commandment in Exodus 20, verse 16. In Exodus 20, verse 16, it says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. 
Again, Exodus 20, 16, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. We need to take note that um, the primary victim of our sins is God himself. And we can become so delusional as to think that we're committing sins and God can't see them or something like that. But we have to keep in mind that the primary victim of our sins is God. Even if we lie to our neighbor or lie about our neighbor, which is to say anyone at all, because everyone is our neighbor, right? It doesn't mean the guy next door. By neighbor, the Bible means anyone and everyone. That lie is against God first, and it's against the person second. Every sin we commit is against God first. There has never been a case where uh, the victim of our sins has only been one person. It's always more than one, because God is the first recipient of our sins. In Psalm 51 verse 4 is where we, we know this truth. In Psalm 51 Verse 4, it says, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. So, um, David makes it clear, again, as he says, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. He's speaking to God here. So, against God, our sins are committed. As far as the confirming verse uh, of the commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, we go to Romans 13, 9, where we found so many of the other commandments. In Romans 13, I'm on the wrong page, Romans 13, verse 9, for this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment that is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Since the commandments are the law, uh, the commandments as a whole are called the law of love. Because every one of the commandments has to do with love. If we keep them, we are showing love. For instance, if we keep the first four commandments, we're showing love toward God. If we keep the last six commandments, we're showing love toward our fellow man or our neighbors. And in this case, if we lie to or lie about someone then we are not showing love, right? It's um, common sense. If God says that keeping these commandments shows love, then obviously that means breaking the commandments is not showing love. It's, it's not a difficult equation. So even though you all know this, we're, we're still just doing a breakdown here. Where do lies come from? Where is the source of every lie? How do we understand that lies are evil in the first place? Well, we get this answer from the lips of Christ when he's speaking to the lying Pharisees. <laughs> in John 8, 44. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says the following, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So any time we speak a lie, any time we lie about someone or to someone, that is quite literally either the devil himself or one of his demons speaking through us. There is no such thing as speaking a lie in a godly way. No, no good comes from a lie. So it can never be said that um, it can never be said that God has given us a lying tongue. It's always been the devil himself. Because our God is a God of truth, and we will get to those verses too. That God is a God of truth. He literally cannot lie. You know that there are a few things that God cannot do, right? He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful, but he can't do the logically impossible. Because he's a God of logic, too. For instance, he can't make a square circle. It's logically impossible. He can't make a married bachelor. It's impossible. 
He can only speak truth, he can never speak a lie, because it's impossible for such a holy character to speak lies. There are things that God cannot do. However, those things are totally impossible no matter the circumstance anyway. A married bachelor, a square circle, a truthful lie? No, those, are, those things are logically impossible. Those are things that God cannot do. So whenever any of us speak a lie, that is 100% guaranteed to be from Satan's uh, lips himself. You cannot blame God when you lie. It's always going to be demonic no matter what. And so we have that established. As we, we've known this all the time anyway. We know that God doesn't lie. We know that it's always been from the enemy. There's no question about it. But lies, you have to understand, they are the native tongue of Satan. That is his language. That has always been his language. Well, not when he was Lucifer, when he was in heaven, that, uh, you know, he did speak truth. He did believe truth. For a while... And then his arrogance got the better of him, and he uh, became the father of lies. He's the first thing to ever speak a lie. Ever. And he's been doing it ever since. And yes, I do say his name in heaven was Lucifer. It's a You know that somebody hasn't read the Bible very much when they call Satan Lucifer. No, Lucifer was his heavenly name. That was his name in heaven. Ever since he got booted out of heaven, his name has been, number one, Beelzebub, number two, Satan, number three, the devil, and things like that. But Lucifer was, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, Lucifer was his name in heaven. There's a reason his name was changed. When he fell from grace, his name was changed. So even when he tells people, my name is Lucifer, be like, no, it isn't. That's a lie. It's not his name at all. Not anymore. Lies have been used against every single person who has ever lived. Started with Adam and Eve when Satan said, no, 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 you won't die. And he said it to Eve and then Eve ate the fruit. And then she deceived her husband. And then he didn't stand up for truth. So like they were both guilty. But lies have been used against every single person on earth. It's just the lies are more prevalent against Christ and his people. You see the lies popping up all the time. All the time against his people. Um, there is a passage that many people frequently use to try and prove, quote-unquote, that, uh, that Jesus is a liar and he's a sinner, actually. So let's read this passage real quick in Mark 2, verses 23 to 26. Mark 2, verses 23 to 26. And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began, began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have ye never read what David did when he had need, and was in hunger, he and they that were with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat but for the priests, and gave also to them which were with him? There are those who try to use this passage to prove that Jesus broke the Sabbath. They're trying to call Jesus a liar. However, those who preach this are taking the word of a lying Pharisee above the word of the Lord who corrected the lies of the Pharisees who stood against them. Those who use this passage to say that Jesus is a sinner, that Jesus broke Sabbath, they are literally taking the word of a Pharisee above the word of Jesus Christ. They're saying, oh yeah, those lying Pharisees are 100% correct. Jesus did break Sabbath. But they neglect the, the following two verses where Jesus, well, I mean, he corrected them from verse 25. But the last two verses specifically, Jesus corrected the lies of the Pharisees. In Mark 2, verses 27 and 28, Jesus says, 
And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. When Jesus was correcting them and mentioning David, did you notice that um, in verse 25 he says, Have ye never read what David did when he had need? Need. Okay, so if... So when Jesus is saying in verse 27, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, he's saying that the, the, that human need and meeting that human need is actually part of keeping Sabbath. The Pharisees were so wrapped up in tradition, they, they neglected the needs of their fellow man, and they became liars through their traditions. That's why if we see somebody who's hungry, we feed them and we're not in sin, not on Sabbath. You know, we're not in we're not in sin to feed anyone anyway, unless we're giving them unclean food. That is, then we are in sin because we're passing off, you know, giving something that isn't food to somebody to eat. So we're, you know, perpetuating sin and causing the other person to sin. But meeting human need on Sabbath day is in keeping with Sabbath. So remember, the Pharisees are liars. If they're saying something. Uh, and Jesus corrects it, take the side of Jesus. So again, there are those who try to use this passage to prove that Jesus broke the Sabbath day, which he clearly did not. He corrected them. And there is something even, even more that we need to understand here, that taking the word of a liar above the Lord is what has been... Uh, you know, strongly held to, especially in these latter days. And who are these people taking the word of a liar above the word of the Lord? Well, we can, first of all, let's go to Romans 3, 4. In Romans 3, 4, we read, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. We have to remember that God cannot lie. Cannot. It is impossible for God to lie because his character is 100% holy. Everything he says is in truth, but we do have to be wary about when people speak. When people speak, we need to be able to discern whether they are speaking truth or error. The only way to do that is to go into the word of truth, to read the Bible, and then we'll be able to tell if the person is telling the truth or not. For example, if God says that the greatest gift, the greatest pleasure, the best of everything, the culmination of everything great is to be with him in heaven, then what? Do, then where does the belief come from that heaven is not a good place to be? It's from Satan, of course. Because he's the father of lies and he wants us to hate life anyway. So why, why would we believe the thoughts that heaven is not a good place to be? Or that we don't want heaven, or that we don't want goodness, or we don't want happiness, or we don't want kindness, or, or anything like that. Where does that come from? It comes from the lips of evil itself. So again, let God be true, but every man a liar. Taking the word of a liar above the word of the Lord is not a good way to live. And where do these, uh, where do the words of these liars come from? Well, they come from many places, from the TV, the radio, movies, friends, teachers, professors, scientists, doctors, celebrities, family members, or even just existing inside our own heads. Because where does Satan attack? Our minds. He places thoughts inside of us and then convinces us that they're true, even though they're not. This is why some of the most intelligent people on the planet are actually not very intelligent at all because they're very easily fooled. Easily fooled because they overthink. They don't they don't really have control over their thought processes. Just any thought that comes into their heads, they just say, "Oh, that's true and here's why it's true." But it's really based on how they feel in the moment. It's not based on anything that's true. It's not based on 
uh, it's not based on all the, the it's not based on all the information. It's based on here's what I feel and here's how I'm going to defend it, whether it's truth or lies. It just happens to be that more often times than not, it's a lie. So we can become self-deceived exactly like Satan. You understand that he convinced himself. You realize that? It's not like God convinced him to speak lies or believe lies. It's that Satan convinced himself. He is the king of being self-deluded. So we don't even need uh, friends or the TV or movies or anything like that to convince us of a lie he'll just put it in our heads and if we're not if we're not performing our due diligence in searching the bible for truth and believing the bible then those lies will very very easily penetrate us and get into our hearts now the godly person hates lying words the person who actually pursues truth hates lies in proverbs 13:5 I need to get to it myself. Hold on. Uh, Proverbs 13, verse 5 says, A righteous man hateth lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. So again, a righteous man hateth lying. And herein do you see the difference between a person after God's own heart and a person after, you know, satanic lies. Uh, there are plenty of people out there who are only willing to tell the truth so long as it benefits them. But if lies benefit them, then they're more than willing to speak those lies too, right? Which means they're very wishy-washy. They don't have any stable foundation. So long as they can get what they want, they're more than willing to lie because truth doesn't actually have any bearing in their heart. They'll only speak the truth when it's convenient and comfortable. But if they can get something from lying, then they'll speak the lie. Even, mind you, it doesn't even need to be anything tangible. Many people are perfectly willing to lie just so they can get one over on someone else. They're more than willing to lie just so the other person can get hurt. They're, the reward is the pain that the other person feels. Nonetheless, it's a lie. But the thing is, the person who's after God's own heart hates lies doesn't want to speak any lies and will do everything to make sure they speak truth. That isn't to say that we are exactly perfect. We can be perfect here on earth, but we're still faulty human beings. And there will be times that, uh, that lies are spoken, but then our hearts break and we do better. We confess those things, we repent of those things, and then we use that experience to learn how to not lie. So a righteous man or woman will not lie. They will tell the truth even if it means they will lose everything, including their lives. There's this article of a so-called Christian woman a long, not a long time ago, just a few years ago, maybe two, three years ago, and she got plastered all over the TV because she lied about her faith in order to save her own life in the Middle East. She told her, it was called a harrowing story of survival. How when the Islamic terrorists came into her village, she pretended that she was not a Christian in order to save her own life. And everybody was celebrating this woman as if she did something good. The Lord says in Matthew 16, 25, one second, Matthew 16, verse 25, Jesus says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. If that woman was a Christian, she should have died that day. I know that sounds harsh, but she actually denied her faith denied Jesus Christ to save her life on earth. Which runs totally contrary to the truth that Jesus spoke. Again, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Means, if you're going to save your mortal life, then you, then you forfeit your eternal life. 
But he goes on to say, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Which means if we die in the process of keeping the words of Jesus Christ, then we will have eternal life. And so everybody's been lying about this woman saying, oh, she did the good thing. She did the righteous thing. You want to know why her story was put up? So everybody believes that to be a Christian, you're allowed to lie. You're allowed to deny your faith. That one story from that one woman has weakened the faith of millions who now believe it's okay to deny Christ just to save your own life. That one lie. You see how powerful one lie can be? Thing is, God loves righteousness. And this is said a couple times in uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. By the way, obedience to God's law is counted as righteousness. The word righteous is defined as just, correct, and lawful. Lawful is actually one of the uh, one word that defines what the word righteous means. So to live in righteousness means we are obedient to the commands of God. And he loves righteousness. Listen to the following verses in Psalm 45, 7. In Psalm 45, verse 7, it says, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So, thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. And then in Hebrews 1.9, it's just the, you know, confirming verse. In Hebrews 1.9, it says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. By the way, those two verses actually help to prove, uh, to prove the Godhead. Because in these verses you notice that the Father is speaking to the Son here. And the Father refers to the Son as God, and then says the God of his Son is him. That's why it says, Therefore God, even thy God. So the Father is calling Jesus a God, and then he's saying that, uh, that he is the God of Jesus. So they're both there. These verses really, really help to show a clear separation between the Father and the Son as distinct and unique individuals. But that's a different thing altogether. But just, just so you know, those two verses are extremely helpful because you see the Father calling Jesus a God. And then you see him saying that he is the God of Jesus as well. So, they're both. Now, as we already know, God hates lies. Absolutely hates lies. And it's, it's said, just a, it's said, in Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. It says, these six things doth the Lord hate. So that's how this, this uh, passage begins. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. And here's the list. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Did you happen to notice that in this list of things God hates, lying is mentioned twice? That should give you an idea of how much he hates lies. Twice in one list, he mentions the things he hates. The thing is, he mentions them in uh, two different ways. The first way is generally. Because in verse 17, it says a lying tongue. So generally, lying as a whole is something that God hates. And then secondly, he mentions more specifically false witnesses. Because in verse 19, it says a false witness that speaketh lies. So he hates lies in general, and he hates uh, lying about someone, which is just a false witness. The question is, why does God hate false witnesses so much? Well, like, why? What is the big deal? 
I mean, even if it's just a little white lie or whatever people say, what is the big deal with um, false witnesses? Why does God hate when uh, false witnessing is done? Why does he hate this so much? Well, let's see what scripture says about this. In Matthew 26, 59 to 61. Again, Matthew chapter 26, verses 59 to 61. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. False accusations led to the murder of Jesus Christ. This is exactly why the Father hates false witnesses so much. This isn't to say that a false witness can't repent, mind you. They can repent. Just like any one of us can repent for any one of our sins and God will forgive us, 1 John 1, 9 makes it clear. If we confess and repent, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So every false witness can repent. They just have to choose it. If they choose not to, then that's their fault. But uh, th that's another lie, by the way. It's another lie that uh, Satan tells people that, oh, you've sinned so much, you might as well not even repent. You might as well just think you're totally and completely lost and that you are hellbound and all this. Just don't even worry about it. You're going to be destroyed forever. Because that's just another lie that Satan speaks. The real issue with it is that people believe that nonsense. They believe that they're irredeemable. They believe that it's not worth repenting. So my point is, even though these false witnesses were witnessing against Jesus, that isn't to say that every false witness, of which we're all guilty of at some point or another, right? Every one of us is guilty about lying about someone. But for those of us who have repented, we know that God has been faithful and just to forgive us. So again, the reason that God hates false witnesses so much is because it led to the murder of Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. You'll see that these false witnesses just twisted scripture. They twisted the truth and made it a lie. Because what did they say? What did they say? What was their false accusation? They said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Right? That's what they said. But that was false witness. In Matthew 24, 2, in Matthew 24, verse 2, it says, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So yes, the Lord, um, the Lord did say the temple would be destroyed. He did say that. However, the false witnessing came from this. In John chapter 2, Verses 19 to 21. John 2, verses 19 to 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. The Lord wasn't even talking about the temple building. He was talking about his own body. That he, would ri that he would raise up in three days. But these false witnesses combined two different statements to make a lie. Yes, Jesus did say that the temple would be destroyed. But you notice that when we read in Matthew 24 too, that he didn't say anything about it being raised up in three days. No. But when he was talking about this temple of his body... He would raise it up in three days. He was telling the truth. And by the way, he was telling the truth about the temple anyway. Because less than, uh, less than 40 years after, uh, after he died, yeah, the temple was destroyed. It absolutely was. Not one stone upon another. So he was being truthful. 
But these false witnesses declared that this, uh, where this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. That's not what he said. It's not what he said at all. This is what happens when people don't want to hear the truth, but they just make it up. It's very easy to find the truth if you just look for it. But you see that it ends in false witnessing when they intentionally ignore the information that would, you know, prevent such lies from being believed. So as far as how the wicked act in regard to lies, let's go to Jeremiah 9 verses 3 through 5. Jeremiah 9, verses 3 through 5. Notice what uh, God is saying through Jeremiah here. Jeremiah 9, verses 3 through 5. And they bend their tongues like their bow for lies. So lies are used as weapons. That's what they are. They're used to hurt. They're used to kill. They're used to destroy. So, and they bend their tongues like, uh, yeah. They bend their tongues like their bow for lies but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. Pause. Let's uh, continue. So, yeah, again, um, how the wicked act, how, they're, how they use lies. Let's start again. Jeremiah 9, verses 3 through 5. And they bend their tongues like their bow for lies. So lies are used as weapons to hurt or to kill in terms of false witnessing to the point of that the person lose their life, loses their life. But they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. Which means they don't even necessarily have a compulsion to speak the truth. Remember in the beginning, we were talking about how so long as it's convenient, they'll tell the truth, but if it's not convenient, then they won't. Um, so, uh, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in any brother. For every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. That verse is really just confirming where we saw, let God be true, but every man a liar. Just be careful. Test everything that everyone has said. Open your Bible. Open your Bible. Test everything I say, test everything you hear from any other source, and definitely test the thoughts in your head, just like we're told in 1 John 4, 1. Test every spirit. Test every thought. Make sure it's, it's from God. If it's not, then the Bible will reveal it. And then in verse 5, And they will deceive everyone his neighbor, and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies, and weary themselves to commit adultery. What stands out here is that they taught their tongue to speak lies. There are so many people out there who have been speaking lies for so long that they don't even realize they're lying anymore. That's scary. It's a, um, it's uh, they're called compulsive liars. They lie so much that they actually think they're telling the truth. Now, False accusations and other lies can end up giving us a reputation we don't want to have. If we exercise our tongue in speaking lies, then we can end up giving ourselves a reputation that we don't want to have. This reputation can cause others to not want to be around us for fear of being falsely accused as well. So if you develop a reputation of accusing people falsely, and other people know about that, they won't want to be around you because the possibility really exists that they will be falsely accused as well. So why would they want to be around somebody who has a reputation for falsely accusing people? Lies can ruin people's trust in us because they feel that they cannot trust what we say. Why do you think every one of us grew up knowing about the story of the boy who cried wolf. Because when the time comes that we actually speak the truth, everyone has trouble believing it because we've developed a reputation for speaking lies. The boy who cried wolf is one of the... The more you grow up, the more you mature, the more you see the relevancy of such a story. And... 
I want to show you a verse that is way more accurate than you probably understand. I know I didn't fully understand it until I started praying on it. In Psalm 58, verse 3. In Psalm 58, verse 3, it says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Again, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Obviously, God's not being literal here, because no baby can speak. No baby is even really conscious. I mean, they basically exist. All of us who have kids, you know what I'm talking about. They're, they're just eating machines and screaming in some cases, and definitely with the diaper stuff. You know, they're definitely not speaking a thing, let alone speaking lies. So what does God mean? Well, again, this verse is way more accurate than you may be thinking. Look at how young people are when they are taught to lie. There are so many lies that we're taught from the time we're babies. So let's look at just a few of these lies that we're taught. Christmas, Easter, birthdays. You know, what? just for a second, you know what's the most tragic thing about birthdays? They're lies to begin with. Our life did not start the mo on the day that we came out of our mother's womb. Our lives began at the moment of conception, nine months prior to coming out of our mother's womb. And yet we consider the day of coming out of our mother's womb as day zero. Why do you think atheists have such an easy job arguing for abortion? Even, even Christians declare that you're not born, you're not a life until, you're, until you come out of your mother's womb. They don't think they're saying that, but in saying that at your birth was day zero, day one of your life, then yeah, of course. By the time we come out of our mother's wombs, we are around nine months old already. Not one day. So birthdays are top to bottom, a lie. Uh, some other things that children grow up learning about that are lies. Fairies, ghosts, right? There are not people spirits walking around, essentially just scaring people. That's not true. That's not what the Bible says about death. Other things like witchcraft. Look at Harry Potter. Vatican sanctioned that one. Or envy and idol worship is okay. Focus on earning lots of money. Or follow your heart. Or only you can help yourself. Or focus on number one. Right? All those things are lies that we're taught from the time we're little. And the devil convinces us to lie. He actually is... He's so cunning. So, so cunning in that he can convince us to not just speak lies, but to believe them too. In Isaiah 59, 1 through 4. Again, Isaiah 59, verses 1 through 4. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. The truth here is that it is by our choice that we become separated from God. What the devil tells us is that, no, God's just mean. No, it's God's fault. That's what the devil says. But let's keep going. Uh, starting from verse 2 again. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. By the way, mischief just means evil. So here is how crafty the devil is. He can convince people that it's okay to live a life filled with lies and enjoy and be entertained by those lies, right? TV and movies, magazines and novels. He can, he's so crafty, he's so intelligent that he can actually convince us that living a life filled with lies is perfectly okay. No problem at all. 
a life wherein iniquity is embraced and enjoyed. And we cling on to those iniquities with all our heart. At the same time, he will convince people that God is not answering their prayers because God is mean, God is unloving, God is unkind, and he just hates them. The devil is so cunning, he will convince the person who lies that it's God's fault, not theirs. No personal accountability, no personal responsibility need enter into this heart. No, it's everyone else's fault. It's God's fault. I don't need to hold myself responsible for speaking lies. I don't need to hold myself personally responsible for lying about others or living according to lies. No, it's everyone else's fault. They just want to take away what I enjoy. They just want to take away the things that make me happy. It's their fault, not mine. That's how cunning the devil is. In Jeremiah 7, oops, in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 8 through 10, Jeremiah 7, 8 through 10, Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? Here's what's being said here. Uh, firstly, the attitude of the once saved, always saved, or once under grace, always under grace, doctrine of the Baptist church is directly confronted in these verses. Those who believe they can live in sin and still walk rightly with God are deceived. Those who believe they can walk with God and still blow off his commandments are self-deceived. What about the part where it says burn incense unto Baal? What does God mean by that? Well, we know that incense is symbolic of prayer. We saw that in the sanctuary. We see that in Revelation. Incense is symbolic of prayer. So when it says burn incense unto Baal, remember Baal is one of the names of Satan. Praying to a God which is not the God of the Bible, even though we think it is, is how we pray to Baal. In other words, if we believe lies about God's character, then we are praying to a God which is not the God of the Bible. Or in other words, as prophecy declares, we're believing in another Jesus, but not the Jesus of the Bible. So at this point, we need to take a break. We've run a little long, but uh, yeah, we'll be back in just a few minutes. All right, so... Oh yeah, here we are. The people of God have the character of God. Or another way to say it is, the remnant have God's character. And uh, Zephaniah chapter 3, oops, I messed up. Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Again, Zephaniah 3, 12 and 13. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall do no iniquity, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. So, yeah, again, we are faulty human beings. There are times that we will lie. The difference between the lukewarm Christian or the worldly unbeliever and the Christian who loves God is, is this. The lukewarm Christian and the unbeliever don't have a desire to do better. The, the Holy Spirit is not working on their hearts. But if you tell a lie, if you bear false witness, and you feel shame about it, that's good. Don't let the devil tell you that that shame is wrong. 
That shame is good. The only reason you feel that shame is because the Holy Spirit is convicting is convicting you of the sin you just committed. That's a good thing if you feel shame when you've done wrong. If you don't feel shame, if you don't feel guilty about lying, that's when there's a real problem. If you're capable of lying, especially lying about someone, and you feel no shame or guilt, then please immediately pray. Seek forgiveness. You should seek forgiveness anyway. Whether you feel guilt or no guilt, seek forgiveness. Because if you're not feeling guilty, yeah, that's evidence that the Holy Spirit is not there. But if you lie and you have that shame, count it all joy. Praise God that he's still working in you. So yes, even when we have our hearts set after God, there, there still lies the potential that we will speak lies. However, the Holy Spirit will make sure we get whooped for it. And we'll receive that spiritual spanking of shame. We'll repent. And we will strive to do better. So the Lord loves truth. It's who he is. The Lord absolutely loves truth. And his people will have his character. His people love the truth, even if it hurts. We won't lie just because it'll, it'll help us to keep stuff. No, we'll tell the truth even if it means we lose everything. So yeah, the Lord loves truth, and those who love him will not speak lies because God cannot lie. In Titus 1, 2, Titus 1, verse 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. So God, that cannot lie. The devil ever tells you that God's just lying or he's he's hyping up this whole heaven thing or he's hyping up this whole peace while we're here on earth thing then the devil's lying of course he doesn't want you to believe that God is true why would he he doesn't want you to be with him uh, I've said this before but try to keep in mind the reason the devil tries to tell people that you know uh, that going to heaven is eh, it's whatever or there's nothing good in heaven. The reason he does that is because he's not going back to heaven. And the example I used a long time ago was this. Imagine, um, imagine that, okay, the, the, the example I used before was this. Imagine you're going to a party and you hear that it's great, but then on your way there, there's some big angry guy coming at you saying hey that party stinks there's nothing good going on there there is nothing great everybody there is a loser and he just keeps talking down and down and down about this party well if you keep listening to this guy then you're going to believe uh, you're going to believe all of his lies before you actually try to find out What's going on? Well, since the devil is that guy who was thrown out of the party for his bad behavior, of course he's going to try and keep everyone else from going in as well. Basically, he's a sixth grade bully who doesn't want you to have happiness because he cannot have happiness. That's it. That's why he's convinced billions that heaven is not a good place to be. Might as well just live in your entertaining lies. Because heaven's no big deal. It's, it's whatever. That's what he'll say. But the Lord loves truth. And those who love him will not speak lies because God cannot lie. The only thing is, when we find ourselves in a lie, yes, repent. But also, work diligently to never lie again. And also in Deuteronomy 32.4. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. So God is truth. Can't lie. 
I just shared Titus 1, 2 and Deuteronomy 32, 4 so that we fully understand that God cannot lie. Ever. So when he says that the ultimate gift is eternal life in heaven, you can take that to the bank. He's telling the truth. And everything else is weak sauce. And as far as uh, the attitude of the righteous go in, in terms of what they speak in Proverbs 8, 7, and 8. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. So again, for my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. Uh, abomination just means disgusting. So to speak lies is disgusting to the person who loves God. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There's nothing forward or perverse in them. So yeah, that is the character of God's people. Lies are actually disgusting to us. They're nothing we want to do, not for riches and reward or anything else. Because pleasing our Father is paramount in the life of the believer. And even if it means losing everything, we will speak the truth. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters, please the Father. That's it. Obey Him. Because the law is written on our hearts, right? So obeying that law is exactly how the saved are, um, is exactly how they're compelled to act. Now, in these latter times, prophecy says that lies will increase and that it'll just be, be the norm. I mean, look at Hollywood. I mean, it's normal. It's absolutely normal to lie. You understand that every movie is a, is a lie, yes? I mean, take the actor. To, okay, take S uh, Sylvester Stallone. Right? When he goes on the screen and he says, I'm Rambo, that's a lie. He's not Rambo. His name's Sylvester. Actually, I don't know if that's his like stage name or whatever. You get my point. So an actor goes on there. That human being is lying. He's pretending to be someone he's not. That on its own makes the entire thing a lie. But prophecy does say that in these latter times, lies would be the norm. In 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. In other words, listening to those evil spirits in their head. And doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Let's read this one more time so you have a good idea of what God is describing people's characters would be in the days we live in right now. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Well, I'll explain what that whole conscience seared with a hot iron thing is about. In these latter times, the word of God says there will be those who abandon faith so that they can embrace demonic lies. You understand? Prophecy says that people in these times would abandon their faith, their Bibles would go unused, their prayer lives will be weak, just so they can embrace demonic lies. They themselves become liars and hypocrites. But what's so crazy is that they are so taken by their lies that they actually believe they're speaking the truth. It's so nuts. It's so crazy. Especially when, especially in those times when you're with somebody and then you hear them, rec uh, you hear them recall the story of when you were with them and it's totally bogus. You're like, hey, why are you saying that? I was there. 
It didn't happen that way. Why are you saying this? Well, for a variety of reasons, people will lie. But it doesn't matter what the reason is. A lie is a lie. So their conscience is so seared and hardened that they believe lies are truth and truth and truths are lies. Exactly like the prophet Isaiah said so very long ago in uh, Isaiah 5.20. In Isaiah 5.20, when speaking of these times that we live in right now, the prophet Isaiah says this, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This is exactly the attitude of our times. Lies are so tasty. Lies are so lovely and good in the eyes of those who abandon faith. They will fight tooth and nail, tooth and nail, to keep the lies that they love. Try to get a drug addict to abandon their drugs. They will fight and fight and fight and fight. Every excuse in the book, just fight and fight. Try to take somebody's TV, fight and fight and fight. Try to tell somebody that they've told a lie. They will fight and fight and fight. Seriously, there is more fighting for lies than there is for truth in this world. Absolutely. There, people have more of a, a vigor, an energy, to fight for their lies than they do to fight for truth. That's why one of the verses we went through earlier was that, um, oh, hold on, I actually want to find it real quick. Um, one of the verses we went through, um, oh, yeah, 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 in Jeremiah 9, 3 through 5, it says, uh, but they are not valiant for the truth. They're not valiant, they're not brave for the truth. They don't have any courage or strength for the truth. Instead, they, they cowardly, seriously, cowardly, defend their lies. And again, they'll fight tooth and nail. They're very valiant for lies, but almost zero strength for the truth. And again, this isn't me saying this. You heard the verses. Go look them up. So, yeah. In these latter times, truth would I, uh, truth would fall by the wayside. It'd be kicked into the gutter, and people would embrace lies. Now we are told quite a number of times that the tongue is very, very unruly, and our tongues need to be bridled. Uh, do you remember the two-part sermon series? One was called "When to Keep Your Mouth Shut." And the other one was um, the power of words. The message, uh, I guess the moral of the story, in both of those was bridle your tongue. Be very discerning as to whether the thing you want to speak is the thing you should speak, or are you just speaking out of emotion? If you're just speaking out of emotion, keep your trap shut, seriously. It's just going to cause pain and agony. And you're going to end up developing the reputation of a liar. So it's best to let your emotions cool down. The Bible even tells us that. Let them cool down and then come back later. So the tongue and its unruliness is mentioned in the Bible several times. Uh, let's go to a couple places. In Psalm 52. Psalm 52 verses 2 through 4. Psalm 52, 2 through 4. The tongue deviseth mischiefs, uh, like a sharp razor, working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Salah. Uh, thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. So yeah, the tongue really loves to speak lies. But it goes even further. If we are not careful, the deceitfulness of our tongues will destroy us and those around us. Remember that. Please remember that. If we are not careful, if we don't bridle our tongues, the deceitfulness of our tongues will destroy us and those around us, just causing pain and hurt and sorrow, not just in ourselves, but amongst everyone around us. I mean, we just come across as a very negative person. Regardless of if we think we're good actors or not, it's easily discerned. 
it's easily discerned. We're it's like we're programmed to see whether somebody is just deceiving us with their uh, with how they're presenting themselves. Everyone knows. It's just whether we're called out on it is a different story altogether. So everyone knows when we're just putting on a show. Don't ever think that you're that good of an actor. It doesn't it doesn't work. So if we're not careful, our tongues will destroy us and those around us. In James chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. James 3, verses 3 through 8. Perfect description of the tongue. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Which is to say, wherever the captain wants to go, all he does is turn the wheel, and that little thing turns the whole ship. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. All this is to say, watch your words. Your words are like bullets. Once they go out, you can't bring them back. Once they're out, whoever they impact is going to be impacted. They're going to be hurt. Watch your words. Watch your mouth. Watch your tongue. Determine whether what you're going to say needs to be said. Always try and think of your words as bullets. Once they're out, you're not going to get it back. And the pain that's caused by them is going to hurt. Now the lips of truth also exist in this world. The lips of truth belong to those who really love the Lord. Now in Psalm 51:15 In Psalm 51 verse 15 it says, "O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise." O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. So if the Lord is our love, our lips, our mouths, will speak those things that please him, because it's no longer us who speak, but him. Just like when we trust that the Holy Spirit will give us the words we need to say in a situation where we've been accused and we're in court or something like that, if we just trust that the Lord will speak through us, then he will. But that applies to every conversation. If we are desperately seeking the Lord, he'll speak through us, and it will be truth. So if the Lord is our love, then our mouths and our lips will speak those things that please him. And in Proverbs 12, 19. In Proverbs 12, 19, The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. That's to say... If you speak the truth of Christ and you stand with him, then even if you die, the truth you spoke will live forever. And, you know, if you're a repentant believer, then you will live forever as well. The truth never dies. But those who speak a lie, not all, and they, they're unrepentant about it, then not only will they die, but their lies will die along with them in the end. So you may get away with a lie for now, but if you don't repent, you won't be saved. So you may get away with it for now, just like uh, to your boss, uh, to your parents, to your children, whoever you've spoken a lie to, even if they don't, uh, even if you, you know, pull one over on them. Uh, so the God of truth just heard you. You may get away with it as it pertains to other people, but God just heard you. So remember. 
the person you are lying to or the person you're lying about, yeah, you may actually be able to trick them. You will never trick God. Ever. And we've gone over these verses before, or this verse specifically, but when it comes to those who do uh, receive the gift of heaven and those who don't, when it comes to those who don't, listen to this, in Revelation 22.15, in Revelation 22.15, those who don't get to enter into heaven, for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. You know, lies, firstly, part of the group that doesn't get to heaven are liars. Here's the thing. This is why Satan works so hard to get people to think that the rewards of heaven are not worth it. Because if he can get you there, then he can get you to commit any sin, any atrocity that he wants you to. You are literally his puppet. If he can get you to believe that heaven is not a great place to be, then he will work those strings he has all over your body to get you to commit any sort of atrocity he wants you to. And that's why he attacks the goodness of God, the goodness of his promises, the goodness of his rewards all the time. But you know what? You know it's real weird about this if you think about it very carefully the reason satan tells people that lies are good the reason he tells people that heaven is not a great place to be is because he knows how great a place it is he wouldn't be saying that unless he understood the truth that heaven is the most fantastic gift he wouldn't be convincing people to abandon their faith if he didn't fully understand that faith is the most beautiful thing we can have while we're on earth. You think, he's, you think he convinces people that heaven is not a great place because he, because he thinks it's actually not a great place? No, he knows it's a beautiful, wondrous, peace-filled, glorious place to be in the presence of God. He understands that heaven is majesty. Heaven is eternally beautiful. That heaven is everything great that you could possibly imagine and everything beautiful that you can't even comprehend. So, because he understands that truth, he'll convince you that it's not a great place because he doesn't want you to be happy. He doesn't want you to have a good life on earth, and he definitely doesn't want you to have a, a good eternity. So, he will sear the conscience, he will harden the heart, he will stiffen the neck. Just so we end up rejecting things that are good. That's why he speaks lies. He doesn't want you to be happy. He doesn't want you to have peace. He doesn't want you to have healing or joy. And let's understand this, okay? Understand this in particular. In Proverbs 26, 28. In Proverbs 26, verse 28, it says, A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. So, a lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. The truth here is this. Lying is an act of hatred, period. It is an act of hatred, period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. When we speak a lie, we display utter hatred. Doesn't matter what you think, doesn't matter what you personally feel or believe. God is a God of truth. God is love. Therefore, if we speak a lie, it means we are displaying hatred. And you notice that it, what it says here, a lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. We also learned in the beginning that every sin is directed toward God first, right? So when we speak a lie, we're showing hatred toward God. 
And we're also, yeah, of course, in the person we're lying to or lying about, we're showing hatred toward them as well. But once again, the first victim of every one of our sins is God himself. So to lie is to show hatred toward God. So we need to repent so that he can forgive us for that hatred we've just showed toward him and whoever else we just lied to or lied about. Now, as far as as far as lies go, there are a couple a couple of things biblically that I want to clear up because these lies are so pervasive in the world that we just I meant to do these during like a question and answer period, but it's much easier to just do it in this sermon. So these are just a couple things that are believed throughout Christianity that we really need to clear up and they're very important. So first of all, does God actually like or enjoy uh, destroying those who reject him? Does he take, does he take any pleasure, any pleasure in destroying those who have walked away from him? Some people say yes, because he hates, uh, he hates uh, wicked people. However, this is not what the Bible says. It, mainly the people who say that God takes joy in destroying the wicked, which he will do in the future. Many people say that he enjoys doing that, but... That's not true. In Ezekiel 18.32, in Ezekiel 18.32, it said, For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. His actual pleasure is that you confess, you repent, you get forgiven, and that you live. His pleasure is that you live. And that's why the devil has to place it in people's hearts that life is horrible and what's the point he has to convince us that life is horrible life is disgusting life isn't worth living heaven isn't worth going to he has to convince us of those things because that all those lies go against the character of god who actually wants you to live and all you have to do is abandon your sins and repent and then live but he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked and also in i mean in an eternal sense yes but also here on earth he prefers that everyone repents but with free will you know just don't think that god is pleased with the death of the wicked because he's not or what about this lie generational curses you know what i'm talking about the original sin doctrine Original, the original sin doctrine came from the Catholic Church, and it's unbiblical. So the question is, are generational curses real? Well, I just told the answer. But, are generational curses real? What are generational curses anyway, like we're taught? You say like, oh, we carry with us the sins of our father Adam, the first human. Because he sinned, therefore everybody who's born is born into sin. Number one, that doctrine is insane because it suggests that if a baby dies, a baby's going to hell. Why? Because it carries with it the sins of its father. That's the implication there. That if you're born in sin, then, and let's say all those aborted babies, the tens of millions who have been murdered in the womb, every one of them, is going to hell according to the original sin doctrine. Why? Because they didn't repent. They didn't have a chance to repent. It, doesn't that sound more like an evil God who would punish somebody for doing nothing wrong? So what's the truth here? In Ezekiel 18 verse 20, we find the truth. Ezekiel 18 verse 20. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So no, generational curses are not real. 
when God commanded that even the children of the wicked nations, like the Canaanites, when God said, all right, destroy the Canaanites. So when God commanded that even the children of the wicked nations uh, be destroyed, he knew. Because like, the question is, why did God command that children should be killed? He knew that those children would only learn to deny him because of their wicked parents. From generation to generation, evil things are taught. But the Bible nowhere says that the sins of our parents fall upon us. We are responsible for our own sins. So we can't even blame our ancestors or our, our fathers or our mothers. Like, no, your sin is on me. No, 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 your own sin is upon yourself. So here is an example of a, of a generational curse in its truest sense. Okay, because we don't carry the sins or iniquities of our fathers. That's not what the Bible says. So, is uh, our generational curses true in any way? Yes, but not in the way you're thinking. Think of things like cancer and diabetes. The more I study the Bible and the sciences, the more I can see that the idea of genetic predisposition is not real. You know what I'm saying? The doctors say, oh, well, did your grandmother, did your mother have, uh, have diabetes? Oh, then you are genetically predisposed to getting diabetes. That's bunk. That's not true at all. But how does this play into generational curses? The reason things like cancer and diabetes seem to happen from one generation to another is because the parents have led their children to eat the same foods and live the same lifestyles which they themselves lived. Due to ungodly living, the children receive the same diseases their parents received. However, if that child lives by faith, lives, uh, lives the lifestyle of a man or woman of faith and eats the diet which God commanded us to eat, then there's no reason at all that they should ever come down with cancer or diabetes or really much of uh, any diseases in that realm. Will we get sick every once in a while? Yeah, but we'll heal real fast. <laughs> so do generational curses exist? Yes, but not in the way you're thinking not in the way that we carry the sins of our fathers upon us. No. Generational curses exist in the way that we learn ungodly lifestyles from, not just our parents, by the way, our older siblings. We learn an ungodly lifestyle from our friends, which is why parents need to be directly involved with who their children's friends are. We learn bad habits from friends, family, teachers, TV, and then suddenly we come down with a disease and we say, oh, I was always predisposed to having that disease. No, 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 that's not how it works. You destroyed your body with your choices and it came down with a disease. That's it. But yeah, being predisposed to a disease in a medical sense, no. Because you follow God and yeah you find out real quick that being predisposed to something doesn't mean you're gonna get it. How about this idea? This is the last one we'll do, by the way. Is it okay to lie in order to protect someone? Like the woman we talked about in the beginning, who she lied about her faith to save her own life. Well, obviously she was wrong, but what about when it comes to lying for the sake of someone else to protect them? The, the reason this argument is made is because of the story of Rahab. That she lied to protect the spies of Joshua, and she was blessed. So, does that mean that lying in certain circumstances is right? Well, let's read this part of the story real quick. In Joshua 2, verses 9 to 14. Joshua 2, verses 9 to 14, just so we're familiar. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. 
For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, when ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, and that ye will save alive my father, and my mother, and my brethren, and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business. And it shall be, when the Lord hath given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. So what Rahab did was, she let the spies down. Uh, she hid the spies. And then lied about where they were. And she said, uh, she was declaring, uh, she was asking them, since I showed you kindness, please spare my life and the life of my family. But the thing is, she ended up in that position from a lie. So does that mean she was blessed because she lied? Rahab believed that God could take the city because of what she heard about in regard to the Red Sea. That's why she mentioned it. She mentioned that everybody in the city knew what God did for Israel. You know, at the Red Sea, he dried it up. He delivered the kings, uh, what were their names? Sion and Og. And because everybody had heard about that, everybody lost their courage. They said, oh, God is with these people. We don't stand a chance if they come against us. So God's plan has always been to draw every soul to him. And Rahab was one soul that actually responded. Yes, God is calling everybody to repent. He's calling everybody to be part of that heavenly family. However, as you see in the case of Rahab, the entire city denied God. She was the one who actually responded in a positive way to God. Still, she did lie. It's true, she did lie. But you have to remember that she was a babe in Christ. She was brand new, brand spanking new into the faith in this moment. And as a babe, she had to learn right from wrong, just like all of us. A child doesn't necessarily know that lying is wrong. They have to be taught that. And still, you know, being a believer, the promises apply to her as they do to us. So, since she didn't know, okay, she didn't actually know that lying was a sin, the Lord won't judge her for it. Because she didn't know. And we are told this, right, in um, Acts 17.30. In Acts 17.30, where it says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So Rahab didn't know that, sh that lying was a sin. She's not like, she wasn't in the position we are today where we absolutely, positively know that lying is a sin. Therefore, we are held accountable. She wasn't in that position. And it also says in 1 Timothy 1.13, 1 Timothy 1.13, uh, who was before, when Paul was talking about himself, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So Paul was even talking about himself that he received mercy because he was, he was ignorant of his sins. He actually thought he was serving God. Now keep this in mind. Rahab was a Canaanite pagan harlot. In short, she was an extremely active sinner. But at the same time, at the same time, she heard about and was moved by the truth surrounding the God of Israel. Everybody heard the stories of the Red Sea. Everybody heard the stories of what God was doing for Israel. But 
for the most part, the hearts were not moved to love the God of Israel. She was one of those few and far between hearts that was moved. So yes, her lying was wrong to do. There's no doubt about it. But her intentions were to seek favor of the God of Israel in the only way that she knew how. Like, okay, there's this picture I saw before. And these kids, I really hope their parents didn't, like, spank them or anything. These kids, remember, we're talking about three, maybe four years old. It's a picture of them putting a garden hose into the gas tank of their parents' car. In their minds, in by their young, young intentions, they just wanted to help their parents. Could they be held accountable for that? No, they couldn't. They were too young. They didn't know any better. Was it inconvenient? For sure. Absolutely for sure. But could they rightfully be punished? No, that was a teaching experiment. I mean, a teaching experience. Learning experience. <laughs> they just needed to be taught like, hey, you broke it. No, just kidding. <laughs> but, like, you can't put water in the car. It won't do anything. In fact, it'll break it. So just teach them. But they tried to do well in the only way that they knew how. Just like a babe in Christ. They serve God in the only ways they know how. When they learn more, then more is expected of them. Just like all of us, right? So, just because she was young in faith and her intentions were pure, does that nullify her lie? No, it doesn't. It was still a sin. But she is blessed by her faithful actions, as is declared in the New Testament, in Hebrews 11.31. In Hebrews 11.31, it says, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And it's mentioned again in James chapter 2, verse 25. Again, James 2.25, Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had, uh, and had sent them out another way? She was justified by her works, but only because she was a babe in Christ. She was not someone who understood that lies were a sin. So yes, she lied in the process of hiding Joshua's men, and that was wrong, as scripture declares from Genesis to Revelation. She was wrong to lie. However, her faith and obedience allowed her to gain forgiveness, just as every one of us receives that same forgiveness when we repent. As she embraced the God of Israel, she no doubt would have sought forgiveness for all her sinful ways, because she would have grown in the faith, right? She would have learned at some point uh if she would have learned at some point about commandment number nine, this is well after the commandments were established. I mean, they were always established, but you know what I mean. This is well after Exodus 20. So she would have learned. And then when she learned like, oh, I lied to hide those spies. That was a sin. She would have repented. She had a heart for God. Now, the thing is, had she not repented, then Paul, in his letter to the Hebrews, or James in his epistle, would have said that. They wouldn't have said she was justified. They would have said, like, oh, she lied and then she never repented, or something like that. It wouldn't have been said that she was justified. Because God is not a respecter of persons, and he doesn't compromise his truth in any way, that has to mean that Rahab did repent. And if Paul and James declare her blessed, and they were righteous men of God who were moved by the Holy Spirit, then it's only because she did exactly what Scripture says is necessary to gain the blessing of forgiveness. So we can rightfully say that Rahab repented. And as she grew in her walk, after her act to help Joshua's men, she left her pagan, harlotous way, I mean, harlot way of life behind, and she became a true member of the heavenly family. In short, 
No. We cannot lie to save someone else's life and count it as a righteous act. Because we know that lying is sinful. Because we know about commandment number nine. We all have Bibles here. We know that lying is wrong. Therefore, we cannot be counted as innocent when we lie. In fact, it's iniquity because we know it's a lie. I mean, because we know it's a sin and we do it anyway, it's iniquity. It's not just a simple sin anymore. When the atheist who knows nothing about the Bible uh, lies, yeah, they're, they're in sin, but they've also rejected God too. So they're in a whole heap of trouble anyway. But don't ever think that lying is ever justified. It's not. And God will hold each of us accountable for every lie, for every deceit, for every manipulation. He, I mean, I don't have the verse right now, but Jesus says that we will be held accountable for every idle word. So everything we ever speak, we will be held accountable for. If we repent because those words were unrighteous, then we're forgiven. If we speak righteousness, then he'll account that to us as well. So, that's commandment number nine. I know it went long. I'm sorry if anyone's tired, but there was a lot of material. But don't ever think that lying... Uh, that, don't ever think that there's such thing as white lies and black lies. No, there are only lies. And it can be tough to stand for truth. Absolutely. However, if you're in this to please the Lord and you know that the Lord is pleased by truth, then it will be much, much easier to speak the truth. So let's end in prayer. Father, we give you thanks and praise that everything you say can be trusted. We thank you that you are a God of truth and that you would never deceive us. You would never lie to us. You would only help us. Father, let us trust in your word and not in our hearts. Let us trust in your word and not in our opinions. Let us trust in your word and not in the evil things that your enemy brings to our minds. And Father, let us live this day according to truth. Thank you so much for giving us rest. And for all of us, Father, continue us in the path of righteousness. As best we can, we make these prayers to you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.